Praise the Lord, everyone. I'm back with the second segment as we look at dealing with the weights. We left off talking about the absolute importance of seeing sin as God sees it. And that's why I wanted to spend a little bit of time on this because I'm convinced that many people look at sin in a very cavalier, in a very simplistic way, not realizing that sin is what cost Jesus his life. Sin is what caused him to suffer, to bleed, to be spit on, to be embarrassed, to endure the suffering as a rank sinner when he knew no sin. In fact, he became sin for us, for me, for you. But if we don't look at it the way he sees it, then our attitude toward it would also be cavalier. And I am convinced that as I look at my own life and as I look at the people in which I counsel, it is one of the greatest inhibitors to the blessings of God. Because if you don't see sin, which cost Jesus his life, as God sees it, then your attitude will not take upon an attitude of humility. And you will be a little more uh, insensitive toward continuing sin. And I like to use as an example an Old Testament text in Psalm 51 because it speaks to David. And I'm talking about what true repentance is. Remember, that's the third step in this process of getting rid of the weight. And as you turn in your Bibles to Psalm 51, verses 1 and 2, I want to share with you uh, just some thoughts that the Holy Ghost had given to me for you. It's so, so very important to see sin as God sees it. David, as you well know, saw uh, a woman that he thought was very beautiful. It was a woman that was not his. He had the luxury of all kind of women. Uh, but he saw someone that he wanted, and he took what he wanted. And obviously David knew about God. He was a man after God's own heart. But he saw what he wanted, and he did what he wanted. And as you well know, when you want what you want, you have a tendency to continue to go after it if you're not sensitive to sin. And of course, he got what he wanted, he did what he wanted, and there's a baby that came out of this uh, ungodly alliance. And of course, that baby died. And it's in this context, after that baby died, that David experienced true repentance. He said, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. He is saying that forgiveness, grace, and mercy can only be from God. He saw himself as the reason for this child's death talking about seeing sin like God sees it. The next three verses tells you clearly that you must have an awareness of personal sin and that that sin is an offense to God. That it's a guilt action on your behalf that's against God himself. Notice what he says. For I acknowledge my transgressions. Notice he's not putting them under the rug. He's not trying to put them on anybody else. He's not blaming Bathsheba. He's looking at himself. And my sin is ever before me against thee. Thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. He is saying that whatever you want to put against me, whatever you want to do, uh, to harm me, Lord, you are fully justified because I'm not hiding anything. I was absolutely wrong. Is that your attitude? Are you always making excuses for what you do by putting it on other people? Are you saying that you would be better if it wasn't for your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your ex-husband, your ex-wife? That job, that employer, that employee, if they did what they did, right, so on and so forth? Don't misread me. I'm not trying to say that all these people are right. But the point is, David was not trying to put off on anybody else what he knew he was wrong doing. And that's what I'm trying to get you to see. 
He said, Behold, in verse number five, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desireth truth where? In the inward part, in the hidden parts, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. I'm saying to you that there must be an awareness of your personal sin and guilt as an offense to your God. And then there must be a desire to be clean, a desire for God's joy and, and uh, fulfillment of his spirit in your spirit so that you can be in lockstep with him. If you've walked with God for any degree of time, that you ought to know that as soon as you sin, there's a, a break in fellowship. Notice I said not break in relation, not break in terms of your spiritual connection with God because when he saved you, he saved you to the utmost. He said, I've come to abide with you forever. Ah, but because of sin, and if you have anybody here listening to me, you know it. If you're viewing me, and you know this for a fact. Anytime you sin, there's a break in fellowship that bridge between you and God has in some ways been, been severed. Not your relationship, because God is the one that saved you, but the connection is, is, is no longer like it was. It's very much like a relative. You know what I mean. You could have a loved one that you haven't seen in five, six, seven years. And when you're in their presence, it's very hard to build a relationship first because you haven't been talking to one another. You haven't seen e each other. You, you don't really know each other. So it takes some time to reconnect. And that's why I'm saying you must have a desire to stay connected with God because that's what happened to David. Even a man after God's own heart he severed that fellowship. He severed that tie that he had when he was regularly supping with God. You must desire to be clean. You must desire uh, to have God's joy. Look what he says in verse 7. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart. Hallelujah. Oh God. And renew a right spirit. A right spirit within me. I'm saying to you, since, uh, saints of God, we must see sin as God sees it. Because if we don't, we will inhibit our own blessings. That the blessings that God has with our name on them, that the blessings of the Lord that maketh rich and add no sorrow to it will not flow uh, ex uh, speedily into your life, speedily into your household, because you have this cavalier attitude towards sin. Sin must be dealt with, it must be confessed, but you also have to have a desire to turn. You know the text is very clear. You know it, you've heard it many times. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Notice the text then says, Then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins. Then I will heal their land. And finally, when we talk about repentance, we're talking about true repentance here now. A change of mind and a change of behavior. That's what I'm saying to you. If you want the blessings of the Lord to flow in your life, you must see sin like God sees it. And the last thing I want to make mention of is that when you look at verse 16 and verse 17 of this song, you must see it the way David saw it and how God sees it. You must have a desire not to just go through the motions. Notice David said, For thou desireth not sacrifice, else I would give it. You don't delight in offerings and bird offerings. God is not all that interested just because you show up at church. Anybody can show up at church. People who are ungodly show up at church. He says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, thou will not despise. God is looking at your heart. Are you broken because of this mistake? Are you broken because you broke other people's hearts? Maybe you've hurt the children that you actually played a role in bringing into this earth. You may have brought pain and irreparable damage into the lives of other people. Are you broken because of it? I hope you're hearing my heart because God wants to touch your heart. 
Finally, as we look at this psalm, I'm talking about true repentance here. I'm talking about seeing sin as God sees it. You must then, as David did, have a commitment to serve him. Remember I said, it's more than turning from your sin, it's turning to God and doing the things that God wants you to do as evidence that you're truly repentant. Look what David says. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation, in verse number 12, and uphold me with thy spirit. What does that mean, thy free spirit? He's saying, make me willing to obey you, Lord. Make me willing to obey you. In verse number 13, he says, Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. What is he saying? That I'm going to do what I need to do to help people return to you. Hallelujah. He is a person who's truly repentant. Not only is he sorry for what he did, but he's now saying, I am going to give every ounce of my energy to see the word of God go forth in the lives of other people. I want to see the power of God move with dispatch. And so, saints of God, we've talked about many things. And I don't want this whole uh, process of the steps needed to get rid of the weights to be uh, overshadowed by some of the uh, absolute importance of heart issues. Obviously, first step we talked about was to identify the weights and the sins. The second step was to make sure that we had a new focus. But all of the time I've spent here, at least for the last 12 minutes or so, has been on the whole issue of losing weight through the third step and that's confessing, confessing, partly, pardon me, and confessing your sin and repenting of those sins. That being said, and your heart is pure, and the bridge has been reestablished in terms of fellowship between you and God. Now you're ready to fulfill the fourth step, and that is to be filled with the Spirit of God. Now let's first of all make sure that we're clear when the Bible says be filled with the Spirit. And the text says, be not drunk with wine which is in excess in the book of Ephesians, but be filled with the Spirit. Notice the imagery is very clear. The word being filled is not foreign to anyone. It's not some special Greek or special Hebrew word. Being filled means simply to be controlled by. Many of us who used to be involved in various different areas of aspects of substance abuse, you know what it means to be uh, high. You know what it means to be filled with laughter. You know what it means to be filled with scorn and anger? If you're filled with laughter, if you're filled with drugs, you're filled with scorn or anger, you're controlled by it. And so therefore, when the Bible talks about being filled with the Spirit, he's saying be filled, be controlled by my Spirit. And there's mechanisms and means by which you do that. And I'm offering up to you three ways Three ways in which you can be filled with the Spirit. One is memorization. The second one is application. And the third one is association. And we'll give substance to each and every one of them. To be filled with the Spirit is through memorization, application, and association. Let's start, first of all, with this whole issue of memorization. Now, before we do that, remember now, you are three parts, your spirit, soul, and body. And there are two things that the power of the Holy Ghost, this spirit of the living God that wants to rest, rule, and abide in your heart regularly. He wants to control your thought process on a daily basis. Do you not know, if you look at the book of Romans, that there is two laws that have uh, been working in your life and always will be working in your life even since you've been saved. The Bible calls it the spirit of life in Christ and the spirit of law, the law of sin and death. You probably remember the text in, in Romans chapter 8 where Paul said there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the sinful nature, God did. Hallelujah. And so you see these two laws are working. The law of the spirit of life in Christ, that has made, let's set you free from the law of sin and death. That law of the sin and death, uh, sp that spiritual law, is what's behind fear and ignorance and disobedience and rebellion 
Yes. But there is the law of the spirit of life in Christ that works in your life. And I can't wait to get to the next segment to tell you how that spiritual law works when you yield yourself. It's not some magic wand. It has a lot to do with you wanting to be filled with the Spirit of Christ. And when you do, hallelujah, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ is yours. Stick with us for the next segment in Jesus' name.